Hi, welcome to This Is Your Spotlight. I am your lovely host, Eurydice Roman. No, that's my announcer voice. And no, I did not work on that just to interview this lovely person that I'm going to interview today. So today here I have, if you don't know him, I'm sure you're going to know his content. And so um, for anybody who is into little hidden gem facts, this is your guy. Uh, Norberto, uh, say the last name with me. Come on. Briseño. Briseño. Norberto Briseño. Norberto Briseño. Mexicano. Meramente mexicano. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so, all right. You recently actually went to Mexico and you talked about what is the tallest building in the world that, well, that, that doesn't like, like in terms of it won't like, you know, shatter. It won't go left, won't go right. Won't go center. It'll just. Durr. So it's not the tallest building in the world, but okay. it is the uh, the first uh, earthquake resist resistant building in the world, La Torre La, La Torre Latinoamericana, which is yeah. huge, and it was a it's a it's an architectural and engineering feat that to this day people look upon as a great uh, a great status symbol, a symbol of of uh, Mexican pride, uh, and which I've always. Is... I was fascinated. I'm telling you, that's amazing. And it's mm -hmm. hard to get something like that, especially going, you know? Yeah, absolutely. So this is, um, this is I'm going to show everybody a little clip of how I got introduced to Norberto's work. And if you have not heard his work, you're going to get a chance to hear it now. So the, this is the one that kind of got me. He hooked me with this one. It's uh, the border between Manhattan and the Bronx at Marble Hill Playground. And uh, I don't think I've, I, I saw it once, but I didn't take a picture and it didn't register. And then once you did it, I was like, oh, that's what it meant. Ding. Wow. And so how did this happen? Before the 1890s, Marble Hill was physically part of Manhattan, with the Harlem River flowing north of the neighborhood. But by the 1890s, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers wanted to build a straight, wide canal that would connect the Harlem River to the Hudson River in an effort to ease ship traffic. So, in 1895, the Harlem River Ship Canal was built, cutting right through 222nd Street, severing Marble Hill from Manhattan, temporarily making it its own island. Then in 1914, Bronx County was created. But this is when things get complicated, because that same year, the old river to the north was filled in, physically connecting Marble Hill to the Bronx. For several years after, there were annexation attempts, including one by a Bronx borough president who planted a Bronx County flag at 225th and Jacobus Place. But in 1984, a Marble Hill resident refused to serve jury duty in Manhattan, saying they were a resident of Marble Hill in the Bronx. So the New York State Legislature passed a law declaring, once and for all, Marble Hill as part of New York County and the borough of Manhattan. Despite having a Bronx zip code and Bronx telephone area codes, Marble Hill is very much part of Manhattan. So that's kind of interesting. Marble Hill is a neighborhood that lies that. just north of Inwood. At the yeah. And who says you don't learn anything while watching? <laughs> so this is the one that hooks me into his work that he's doing now. Well, for those of you who may not know, he also was doing, um, he also does art. But we're not going to talk about the art too much because it's still in progress. <laughs> Artists, we all take breaks and stuff like that. We do. Which is we great. Um, actually, um, so when you went to Mexico, aside from doing the video for that, um, skyscraper, was there other stuff that you did as well? Yeah. I mean, there's stuff that I've always had curiosity, was always very curious about, uh, mm -hmm. cause my family is from Mexico, uh, from Mexico city. Uh, cool. but it had been 17 years since I was last there. Uh, once my grandparents <laughs> passed away, like I just never really found a reason to go back. Um, so it was nice to be able to go back and like, you know, check it out as an adult. Uh, and in doing so, I was just like, you know, I'm doing this video series where I'm just going around checking out interesting things. And I was like, well, let me just do it on Mexico City itself. Um, and there were things that I've always loved about Mexico City, like Lucha, like Lucha Libre, for example. There's a beautiful mural inside Arena Mexico, which is amazing, uh, mm -hmm. a great piece of art um, that doesn't get nearly enough exposure. Um, I did a couple of dark themes, so 
uh, one of my favorite comedians, one of my favorite TV hosts when I was growing up, his name was Paco Stanley. Uh, and oh, he was, yes, yes. Yeah, and he was murdered outside of a restaurant in Mexico City. So I went to go check that out. Uh, I, I went. I did a video on the 1968 Latelolco massacre, um, where the government uh, murdered a bunch of students just before ten days before the 1968 Mexico City Olympics. Um, oh, wow. There's a church that, if you look closely at the church wall, um, there's some hole, some bullet holes that are still there from that tragic event, and you can check them out and see them. So. Stuff like that that I thought was very curious that I um, mm -hmm. I always uh, knew about, but I wanted to go visit the actual places and uh, really get some history out of it because that place, just like New York City, there's mm -hmm. so much history around you. Claro. Uh, that's something that I've always that you know I was always always caught off by, and I could have done a hundred videos more in Mexico City, but you know, time there's only so much time. This is true. Uh, how long did you go for? I went for a month. I want to go uh, stay with family. Uh, I did the holiday. I spent the holidays there, um, and mm -hmm. it was it was it was great. It was great to be back. Um, it's kind of like I don't, it was a cultural and spiritual refresh, mm -hmm. um, and I thought that was something that was really cool to see. You know, the old see the elders in the family to see. You know, my mm -hmm. brother, my sister in law, uh, and oh. all of them out there. I thought that was. I don't know. You miss family. And I think like that was really a much needed break to, mm -hmm. to, to have. No, and it's the best thing, honestly. Sometimes you, you just need that reconnection because when you live here, you get caught up in the bustle and I got to do this, I got to do that. And then to go somewhere where, okay, I'm sure you, um, like in college, when I did business management as a, as a course study, to get my associates, not that anybody was asking, but I'm giving the information anyway, mm -hmm. is that here in the United States, we're on monochronic time. Time is money. Mm -hmm. Each hour that passes, you could be making money to get on the grind and to keep it like that. That's why it's so stressful. That's why yeah. a lot of Americans have all these pre, you know, all these conditions, whether well, it's diabetes, heart disease, lung cancer, you know, and all that. I, I, I'm just saying this is could, what could happen. Uh, I'm not a doctor, folks. I'm just, you know, spreading information here. Um, and then when you go outside the U.S., there's something called polychronic time, time that money can be made at any point at any time. Yeah. And it's a lot more relaxing because when I went to DR, like uh, my family's from Dominican Republic, I used to just be like, the culture is so different. Like it just will mess you up. If you stay there long enough, you're like, wait a minute, you can't, you can't pay this. You can't pay that, but there's money for cerveza, cafe. And <laughs> <laughs> it's because sometimes, um, I mean, especially living in a place like New York city where the hustle and bustle is literally all around you. It's one of those things where like, and especially living in New York city, that's super expensive to live in already. Um, you got to consistently be figuring out, all right, what am I going to do this month? Where's the hustle? Where's the grind? What do I got to do to stay afloat? And I think part of the beauty of going back to Mexico and really, you know, having that refresh is the fact that, yeah, everybody's kind of like, tranquilo. No, like, life goes on. Like, you have to be able to enjoy life in order to, 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 to live it. Um, and I think seeing all the family and seeing the vibe of Mexico as a whole, um, you really get a sense of like, yes, people are working, but people are also enjoying life. Uh, like people are taking the time to, to, to stop, to, to really relish the fact that we are living on this earth. And that's a beautiful thing. And sometimes you forget that when you're here, uh, when you're kind of grinding and just consistently figuring out what's the next move, what's the next step, my career, my job, all of these things, you don't really have a time to, to to pause and look around and really enjoy the life that's happening all around you. Yes. Like, you know, the beauty of like, um, you know, leaving the U.S. And then, you know, you're somewhere in like the home country and you're just at a beach and you just sit there in a chair and watch the waves. Yeah. Or like 
you know, you, you're, you're getting a tan, make sure you don't, <laughs> make sure you don't fall asleep. And then, you know, you, you, you come out looking like a pork rind con chicharrón. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, I think I stayed too long. I'm starting to peel. Is this normal? No, it's not. Mm, no, but that's, that's the beauty of it all. That's like, mm -hmm. you know, to be able to just, um, take a pause and really, um, Really, just look look around you, and I think Mexico granted me that opportunity to do that. But also, like these videos, like the kind of interesting videos, it makes you take pause of the city that you're living in. You get to take the opportunity to like look around and understand that there's so much history with every block, like and ever. rows of this city. True. So, um, did, question: Did you ever live like um, in LA or California at some point? I did. I'm, I'm born and raised it from L.A. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So then why, why yeah. you move, homie? What happened? I'm a, I'm a transplant uh, through and through. Um, mm -hmm. And I live, yeah, I, I was born and raised in, in L.A. And uh, I came to school to, uh, to NYU uh, from wow. between 2006 and uh, left back to L.A. in 2011, then came back in 2020. Um, so, so yeah. So how was it like leaving LA? Because the thing is, during the pandemic, right, both coasts had it bad. New York had its, its issues and California had its issues. So it was just like... I yeah. So at the time, uh, I should probably clarify. What had happened was I was living in LA until 2019. And then I got a job out in DC, actually, in okay. 2019. So I moved from LA to DC. Wow. Then while I was working in D.C., that's when, you know, the world kind of blew up and uh, uh, the pandemic hit. And so I lived there for a year and a half in D.C. before finally making the, the, the move to, to New York in 2020. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, yeah, it's just it's just one of those things that uh, kind of life gives you lemon. So you make lemonade. Like I said, boom. Porque cuando la piña se pone amarga, a, a que exprimirla y sacarle el jugo y ya, seguir caminando. Y sí. Pues no hay de otra. Siempre. No hay de otra. Quisiera no. decir que sí, pero no hay de otra. No. Um, so, okay. LA, DC, and New York. You've been to three, like, of the major cities. Mm -hmm. Which city did you feel that was more like, I could survive here, I can make it, it'll be all right? So, all right, this is this is gonna be it. so. First off, LA is always gonna be home. You never, course, yeah. LA never comes out of you, right? My family's there. Uh, I'm an LA person through and through. Uh, Correct. Just you know, because my community, my my family's out there. But New York has always been my first love, and I think like New York mm -hmm. is a place where there's so much the the vibe, the cultures, the food. There's always something consistently happening in this city a, a, a vibe that pushes you forward. Uh, makes you want to be a better artist, a better uh, content creator, a better a better person. This city kind of pushes you to do better. Um, so I've always appreciated that about the city. There's so much to learn, and this city teaches me constantly. Uh, DC, well, you know what? I I think DC is cool. I get why people love it. It's just not for me. Um, Mm -hmm. Almost, everything's kind of like stuck there. Just like it's just there. Uh, and uh, and I get why people love it. I understand why people love it. Um, mm -hmm. but it's just it just wasn't my vibe. But I will definitely say that it's usually between uh, LA and New York. And right now, in this point in my life, New York is number one for me. Yes, but at some point when you get tired of New York, you're going to go back home, huh? It's the family component. Every time you go back, every time I go back home, and I never noticed this when I was in college, but as I get older, every time you go back home, you see your parents, your aunts, your uncles, and they like jumped in age. They're getting much older every time you go back. And there's a part of me that wants to spend a little more time with them um, because I feel like a lot of time has gone has gone by and I haven't really truly... Uh, I got to spend as much time as I would like to. So I, I, I want to be able to do that at some point. And that's the only reason why I'm, why there's a magnet there that's pulling me there is the family component. I'm Mexican. So for us, family is huge. Um, 
y a veces como que la soledad de aquí como que como que no me va pero you know. no sí, yeah. no pero hay que hacerlo hay que hacerlo no hay de otra um, yeah. el sentido que <laughs> I don't know why it, it, the general consensus is the following with when it comes to being um, a Latino immigrant um, there's there's always home base And of course, there's nothing like Latino guilt. Tú no me llama, tú no me buscas, tú no me manda nada. And you're like, okay, all right, thank you. Okay. Yeah. Like, you know, I barely made rent last month. And um, yeah, I almost got like fired. But yeah. you, you didn't see that. You, you don't know. You didn't ask me anything about that. No, no. Yo no te llame. Sí, sí, sí. Soy la persona más horrible del mundo. No pensé en ti cuando me estaba... I'm Viva Dominican with the following phrase. Cuando me estaba llevando el mundo. <laughs> para no decir la otra palabra. Mm -hmm. So, yo pude estar en una citerna, hundiéndome en el agua. Auxilio, socorro, pero no, no, no. Yo no te llamé. I'm sorry. It's, well, it's the guilt, right? It's one of those things that you kind of ingrained. I see si te lo, te lo inculcan. That you gotta, like... You know, roll, you gotta check in on your parents, and that's true. Um, no, claro. And I think as a student, you don't think of it too much because you're like, man, I'm young out here in the city, whatever. This is no like I'm just, you know, you're you're having such a fun time. Mm -hmm. um, it's only when you get older that you look back and you're like, oh damn, like la vida mm -hmm. se nos está se nos está pasando, and I want to be able to enjoy it with the people that I love. And I think I and I look at my parents and I'm like. Oof, if I thought I was getting old, hey, they're they're getting older. Con todo respeto, pero pero también como que, you know, you you see that. De que mi viejo ya está viejo. And I think that's one of those things that you're like, I want to I wanna be able to spend some time. Just like you do in the city, you know, take mm -hmm. this moment to pause and look around you. También hay que hacerlo con las personas, to, with the people that, that we love, right? To be able to spend time, like take a pause. Not everything has to be about work. Not everything has to be about the stress of life. You can, of course. You can take the moment to spend time with the fam. And for me, my fam, the only thing is my family is in L.A., right? So it's one of those things like, oh, all right. This is true. This is true. Yeah. Um, have you ever taken, like, some food from here or, like, something? Like, do you, do you ever, like, buy the I Love New York t-shirts or, like, we don't have that here in L.A., so let me get you an I Love New York t-shirt or a mug or something? No, I think in the beginning, when I first came here to college, I probably took something back, you know, in two, back, right. in, back in 2006. Because you're like, oh, but me, I know I go, oh, damn, this is crazy. Um, and so you want to take something. Like, let me take an I, I Love New York shirt. But at this point, you're just kind of like, New York is is, is a place. It's it's home. It's uh, You don't really take anything from home to go to another home, no? Like, it's something that, for me, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't resonate anymore. No, no, this is true, this is true. And also the environment of the two places, of L.A. and New York, and this is something that you're seeing all across the country, they're starting to look alike. The places, wow. the cities are all being gentrified in the same way. Oh, damn. To the point where you're like, there's sweet greens out in L.A., there's sweet greens out in New York. This is so weird. So what the, the, the thing that makes New York and L.A. and... Austin and all these places different, unique. I feel like part of it is starting to being chip, it's, it's being chipped away at. Oh, because of gentrification and everything else that we're seeing happening in these cities. Yeah, I, I don't know. Gentrification has killed a lot of character for a lot of things, yeah. and in New York, it really like hurts to see it happen. You know, absolutely. Because it's just like, you know, New York had its character. And it, to be honest with you, the day that um, the whole thing happened with 9-11, mm -hmm. listen, when that happened, I was like, I just I just said the following phrase, we are all screwed. And, of course, I had, you know, the potheads and, you know, the crackheads looking at me like, what you mean? I'm like, oh, wait and see. They're like, nah, you don't know nothing. I'm like, all right, fine. I don't know nothing. And then once it started happening, they're like, oh, my God, you was right. It, we are screwed. I'm like, okay, I'm not worth the mercado, pero. <laughs> I, mean, you, you, I mean, look at everything that's happened since, right? It's just like, okay, 
we woke up a beast. We woke up the monster, and then look where we are now. Basically, um, I want to show. Let me see. There's another video that you did that I find fascinating, and I was cracking up because I've passed by this um, the IFC Center like all the time. Oh yeah, yeah. So I was just like, "There's peepholes? What?" Mm -hmm. There's a people at the AFC Center. You can watch free movies. I was like, nah, are you kidding me? I was like, let's. I was just shocked to say um, the least. Let's see how we can do this. Vamos a ver. And okay. So, yes, this is a. For those of you who don't know, he did something about the people. According to the AFC Center, Bogdan now had a very playful sense of humor, and so he liked these Easter egg types of architectural moments that would make you think or make you smile. It's something that we've never drawn attention to. It's just something that people discover, or they don't. So that's kind of interesting. If you stand outside of the IFC Center on 6th Avenue in the West Village and look to the right of the ticket booths, you'll notice an unassuming metal plate sticking out of the wall at eye level. This is the IFC Center peephole. Here's how it works. If you slide the metal shutters to the side and look through it, you'll be able to catch a sneak peek at one of the movies playing inside. Back in 1937, the original Waverly Theater stood at this location. Then in 2001, the Waverly was converted into the IFC Center with really? redesigns by architect Larry Bogdanow. In 2009, the IFC Center's cafe was converted into theaters four and five, and that's when Bogdanow installed this peephole. According to the IFC Center, Bogdanow had a very playful sense of humor, and so he liked these Easter egg types of architectural moments that would make you think or make you smile. It's something that we've never drawn attention to. It's just something that people discover, or they don't. So that's kind of interesting. If you stand outside of the it, IFC Center on 6th Avenue in the West Village... It's actually that that actually happened. I was just like, what? See, now I'm going to discover the people. Thanks, Norberto. Yeah. Oh, that video, got, that video was, was fascinating. First off, like, mm -hmm. where did I find it? Um, I found... I was reading through Reddit... And somebody talked about the people, and I was like, "What? What people? Is people are people talking about?" Mm. And it's true. On the IFC Center, there is a there's a people where you can literally look through it to watch movies. Um, it, it gives you a sneak peek because you can't listen to the movie anyway, but it gives you an idea of what what what's what they're playing. Um, right. And one of the things that I found so fascinating was that, like, I researched it. And there was one article that did a uh, backstory on it, on Bowery and something. I forget. I'm sorry. I forget the publication. Um, but they made, there's this history about the architect had a sense of humor. And so he installed his people. And it's it was, all, it was a whole thing. And the video did really well. People started talking about it. A lot of people joked like, yo, don't put your eyes on there. You're going to get pink eye. Um, but it was, I mean, it's funny, right? <laughs> and, oh, God. Just, you know, people, people, people are commenting crazy stuff. And one of the things that I uh, appreciate is that the other day I went to uh, I went to go watch a movie at the IFC Center. I went up I went up to the ticket counter, and the girl at the ticket counter was like, "Are you the guy that did the peephole TikTok?" And I was like, "Yeah. How, how do you how do you know about it?" And then she was like, "My bosses were pretty happy about it, but now we have to wipe it down every day." No, we have to. <laughs> Well, all right, cool. I'll take that. It's like, can I get a free ticket though? Like, come on now. <laughs> no, for real. It's like, yo, I can do all this business, all this TikTok business, you know? Like, come on. Like, you know, it got you views. It got you some, you know, unfortunately, you got to wipe down some stuff, but come on. It's not that bad. You know, my movie ticket probably paid itself. So it's fine. No. Um, but it was, yeah, that was really, that was a really cool one. Uh, and I really appreciate it. No, that that's really cool. Um, I'll show you the 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 one that you did about the Met was the most interesting one to me, because the thing is, uh, well, the jig is up. I have to say the secret, folks. Yes, I work at a museum. I, if you see me, yes, I'm I'm that lovely boring guard that you basically ask questions to. <laughs> for those of you who wanted to know or care. Um. So yeah. This one that you did about the Met was interesting because um, I worked there. So when they were training us to work at the museum, <laughs> they told us, okay, the museum was built in this year and this is the original building. It's right here in the American wing. And then you see 
traces of the old building that's been infused into the new building and that's how it came to be and if anyone asks you this building was built in 1870 first it started at 14th street now we're here like yeah that's a lot to remember god <laughs> do you really think people want to have a sparkling conversation with me do i look like that person don't lie to me <laughs> could be yeah they, people want the knowledge when you go when you go to the med yeah so um well you can look it up on his um on his Instagram, <laughs> just in case. Yeah, no, that one that one I believe was a partnership with uh, NYC Go. Uh, Correct. Yeah, Correct. one yeah. was a partnership with NYC Go, and uh, the Met was kind enough to like let me in and kind of shoot around and stuff. Um, and I think one of the things that I really found fascinating about it is that it's accessible to everybody. Um, it's it, these are pieces of of. Uh, of the of the museum that are open to anybody that goes to the Met, um, and that's one of the things that I wanted to make sure that all of my content that with all of my content I want to make sure that everyone has access to these things. I don't want it to be behind closed doors or have people you know people shouldn't have to pay to see all of this knowledge and information because um, I remember them suggesting like you want to see some of our more like hidden you know gems that we have here, and it's just like. It was cool, and I, I did appreciate it, and I really wanted to, but I thought this was something that everybody can literally take a look. Go to these galleries. No, exactly. Of, uh, of, of, of history that are literally right there. No, yeah. And um, the thing about with the Met, they are trying to be more accessible to the public, so I think them opening the doors and letting you you know, into this is their way of um, going forward in terms of doing that. Yeah, they're letting because, people um, like film yeah. things and take photographs. It's a whole thing. Oh yeah, absolutely. And sometimes um, it's a little jarring because uh, like um, anytime I see now somebody with a phone or a video, I'm like, "Am I in it? No, great. I'm going over there." <laughs> I, I remember when I would take out my phone and they'd be like, "Sir, excuse me, no phones," and I'm like, "Damn, all right, all right. <laughs> I'll leave it alone." And it, it, but now it's they're kind of they're trying to be more accessible, and I thought I think that's a great way to evolve with the times. No, of course, of course. So uh, this is what we're talking about for um, everybody who's uh, watching. Here we go. In your gallery, you'll come across this pointed arch that looks a little out of place. This is actually the original Met building inside the Met. Back in 1870, yeah. the Metropolitan Museum of Art was founded with the mission to bring art and history to the masses. The Met was temporarily housed at two locations in the city before moving to its permanent location in Central Park. In 1880, the original Met building was designed by architects Calvert Vox and Jacob Ray Mould. It was called a forcible example of architectural ugliness. A great beached whale stranded in the park, and the Met's first president even called it a mistake. Nevertheless, this was the Met's first permanent building. The arch is part of the original 1880 building building facade that faces east. It's a banded granite pointed arch that used to form part of a window and is representative of the Gothic Revival period. It's described by the Met as a great cyclopean eye. If you head over to the Robert Lehman wing, you'll be able to see the entire west side facade of the original 1880 building. Yeah. But there's more. In 1888, the museum brought in engineer Theodore Weston to continue the construction of the museum. He added two wings to the original structure and moved the museum's entrance to the south side of the building. If you go to the Petrie Sculpture Court, you can see Weston's original entrance from 1888. Throughout the years, the Met has expanded and added sections to the museum. Yes, it's an evolving work of art in itself but if you know where to look in the building you can catch glimpses of its late 19th century history so that's kind of interesting if you go to the met museum I on fifth it. avenue in central it, park and go to the that, second floor I love of how the that's your like tag yeah like, that's your that, catchphrase that was that's like just in the first video that i ever did i just ended it that way so it was like so that's kind of interesting um and then as as people kept like laughing at it because it's like oh it's it's kind of true. Like all of the information I'm giving you, it's not like mind blowing facts or, you know, the one important thing you need to know about New York City. It's like, it's none of that. It's just, hmm. it's kind of interesting information. You, you, hmm. you kind of like your reaction to a lot of this is going to be, huh, that's kind of interesting. Literally that. Um, and so, and I try to be respectful for darker videos. So whenever I talk about like a massacre or, something I try not to say it because I got called out in one video where I said it and it just didn't vibe with the with the tone of the video. Um, but for the most part, I say it whenever it's anything very trivial. 
No, and um, to be honest with you, that's kind of like like the turista response. Like if there was a guy talking, they'd be like, oh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Oh, that's kind of interesting. <laughs> it's, it's, it's exactly that. That's the thing about it. And, and I think like ultimately, I've always been curious about this information. It's all trivia. It's facts that's that are kind of interesting. And I think in the past, you know, before TikTok and Reels came in, you know, you would have to do a YouTube video or do a little, you know, documentary on a lot of this stuff or do a collection of facts. And I think with TikTok and Reels coming in, you this was the perfect medium for that. These are just minute long, minute to minute and a half long videos that just showcase one in kind of interesting fact. And I think that's where all of this took off. It's stuff that you can, that's easily digestible. It's this, you get the same amount of satisfaction as you do when you open up a bottle of Snapple and you see the Snapple pack. <laughs> that's all it is. With a bottle of Snapple. I yeah. do remember those. This, Interesting facts. And you're just like, okay. What? Exactly. You're like, oh, I didn't know the whale had, you know, 10 brains. That's, that, that's kind of great. Interesting. You know, I like, didn't know a jellyfish, you know, basic glowed in the dark in the water. Yeah, great, cool. Yeah. And it's like interesting. mind blowing. It's not gonna be it's not gonna change the trajectory of your life, but this is something that exists in your city. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that I thought was very cool. Like, all right, it's kind of interesting. True. Um, one more thing, um, before I let you go. Um so basically uh, for those who don't know, you were at Pero Like. Um, Pero Like is, um, they do a lot of Latino content. Once you, you co-founded it as well. Mm -hmm. So um, what was that one moment that you're like, okay, I said, yeah. No mas, wave the white flag of surrender. I, <laughs> I, so when, well, did, when, did that when did that happen for you? Well, oof, no, no, no. There's there's a couple of steps to this. So I think first off, like, uh, yeah, back in 2014, uh, myself and three other content creators at BuzzFeed co-founded Better Like, which was their their Latino centric uh, channel. And at the time, it was like making Latino content for young millennial Latinos when millennials were still a thing. We're no longer a thing anymore. Mm -hmm. But it's one of those things that was nice to be able to do these skits and write articles and listicles and do interviews and do all this stuff that's very Latino centric. Uh, right. At the time it was new. Uh, there were a couple of other brands out there that were doing it. I know there was Flama. I know there was Me Too. Uh, they were just yes. kind of doing it, doing something around something that was similar, but it was still new. It was still, so fresh and we had a great team. We had a great team of, uh, of, of creators, you know, um, who, who brought so much personality to all the videos uh, and, it, and really exploded the brand to what it became. Um, I think after a while, I think I'd been there, been at BuzzFeed for five years, of kind of wow. like figuring out what's next, what to do next. Um, and then eventually, uh, just like everything else that's happening in the tech world or in the media world, uh, I was part of the layoffs that uh, that happened. Aww. Yeah, so that's how that's how I came to an end. I was like, and it's funny because I was thinking, all right, so what's the next move? Let me ponder a while while I figure out what my future is going to look like. And then the mm -hmm. universe was like, nope, nos vemos. And so that's essentially what it, what had happened. And, uh, you know, luckily I, I found, you know, my, my current job being the director of social media for Voto Latino. It's one of those things where, uh, you know, Latinidad has consistently been in my content every time I do it, whether it's at BuzzFeed, whether it's Voto Latino, whether it's making funny skits, whether it's doing a Dominican Diablo, whether it's doing... Uh, Dominican Diablo. <laughs> and that was my last video with uh, Gadiel de Lorbe. To, to, yeah. Yeah. And Gadiel is so busy, el pobre, and, you know, he just had the sur he just mm -hmm. had some surgery. Yeah, yeah. You know, but, so. but my last video was, was with him, and, you know, he brought his personality, his comic wit, and it was great. Um, and I think that's one of those things where um, I think as a whole, Latino content is at a point of an evolution. It needs an evolution. I think like sometimes part of the issue is that nos quedamos estancados, nos quedamos atorados. Like you can only say this, like the jokes that I'm, sometimes I'm seeing content where like 
the Latino jokes that are being said now is like, yo, this was said back in 2014. Like, we got to keep moving. Uh, like, you got to let it go. Like, come on, man. Seriously. Because yeah. there's only so much that you can do about being Latinos. And I think at the time it was fresh. At the time it was like we were seeing content where Latino representation was 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 everything. Um, but then after a while, it's like, well, we need more than just that. We need that. We need uh, depth. We need characters. We need uh, we need to stop looking in the past and start looking into the future. And I think that's something that Latino con that's the next evolution of Latino content. Where we make content about not about Latinos, but about people who happen to be Latino. Uh, and I yeah, and it's it's hard because even in the film industry, mm -hmm. it's hard to break in. Yeah. Because, like, for example, um, there's two diametric examples here. For example, Jennifer Lopez rarely plays a Latina character, rarely. But somehow her movies are, you know, box office gold, depending on which movie, you know, you care to watch. Whether it's Made in Manhattan, whether it's The Wedding Planner, whether mm -hmm. it's, like, she won't ever, like, you know, do a deep dive into ethnicity. Like Made in Manhattan, she did. She was actually a Latina. I was like, wow. Oh, and I think planner, it was, was um, I believe. Huh? In the wedding planner, she was Italian. Exactly. So I'm just like, like, okay. Ah, all right. I was yeah. like, yeah, okay, okay. All right, sure. See, sí, como no, right. Yeah. I mean, it's it's the pendulum. And I think that's the thing. Like back in the day, it used to be about Latinos or in Hollywood, but they're playing characters that are not Latinos. Right? No, yeah, and, and then, um, the then, then with the con with content that Latino content that was happening, uh, and a lot of the the new content that was coming up, the pendulum swung the other way, where it's all about being Latinos. We got to talk about being Latino and our Latinidad and all this mm -hmm. and that, and we're all united. Toda esa madre, and it's just like toda madre. That's you know that's cool. You know that's that's it's lo it's nice. It's nice to see our people represented. But now yeah. we have to swing somewhere in the middle, where it's where yes, Latinos can be proud of being on on screen. Latinos, you can have Latino characters who are proud of being Latino, but that's not their defining feature. They are all individuals that are unique, and I think exactly. that's something that's currently missing at the moment. Um, but there's a lot of people that are doing amazing stuff as well. So uh, so we just got to mm -hmm. keep 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 at it. And I think it's mostly for people who. Like, for example, if you're born here in the U.S. and your parents, you know, immigrated from, you know, Latin America, from the Caribbean or even Mexico, or even uh, Mexico, it's just like, OK, I, I got to balance this out how it works, because it's just like you have to learn the English and then you have to still keep the Rasa alive. So it's just like, OK, what's the balance here? Yeah, that's like, OK. I could have a bacon, egg and cheese. <laughs> on Monday, but then Tuesday, I gotta have some platanos. Like this was the Dominican struggle, of course. Some platanos, queso frito, and you know, of just course. to balance it out for I don't get cursed. I'm like, oh, you don't eat the food from back home. Y que se yo que. And he's like, okay. What's that quote from, from Selena where it was like, you know, you're, uh, you're, you're too American for the Americans and you're too Mexican for the Mexicans, or you're, mm -hmm. or you're, you're not enough American for the Americans and you're not enough Mexican for the Mexicans. Exactly. And, and, and then that, you just get stuck in the middle. You're you like, will okay. always you at this point, we are we are just in that zone. And we will forever be in that zone. Like I said, we might as well just take control of the zone and own it. Let's just let, that's just let's just claim it as our zone. That's um, it. So it's one of those things that you know, uh this never it's a never ending it's a never ending uh conversation when it comes okay. to that you that. Well, we could be here all night, but I have to buy some modelo or at least ship it to where you at. <laughs> Never say no to modelo. Obviously. Just say. <laughs> all right. I'll, I'll get myself a presidente. You have a modelo. We call it even. <laughs> nah, pues ahí está, ¿verdad? There una, you go. Una vaina. <laughs> una, una vaina bien. <laughs> una, una vaina well, bien, bien. I appreciate you. Thank you so much for taking your time to be here on my show. This is your spotlight. And uh, this will be uploaded onto the Roman Epics production page on YouTube. And I hope you enjoy. And check out um, Norberto's content on the social media platforms. So um, go ahead. You plug yourself. Go ahead. I'm going to unplug myself. So 
uh, yeah, just check me out. I'm on Instagram, I'm on uh, TikTok, and I'm also on Twitter. So if you want to just follow me at Norberto Briseño, um, you'll find all the cool, interesting things that I that are happening in the world that I live in. Exactly. So thank you, everybody. Hold on. Let me press. And 